And hello, welcome to the ASP.NET Community Standup. Today I have Chris Noring on, and hopefully Jeff Fritz joining any second now. Um, he just rated us from his panel. Let me also pop up my other um, screen so I can see if he's trying to get a hold of me. Maybe he doesn't have the link or something. Chris, welcome on. Thank you, John. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. So while we're waiting on Jeff to hop over, um, can you, like, what do you do at Microsoft? What's, what's your role? Uh, yeah, so my role is that of a cloud advocate, meaning that I build tools like we're going to see later in the show, but I also create a lot of content and trying to facilitate uh, things for developers in general, right? So it's not quite what you do, but it's more about facing off with the community. And more exactly, I talk a lot to universities and students and beginner audience. Awesome. Okay. What are some of the things you hear from, from beginners as they're getting started? Uh, what I hear is that a lot of beginners have been subjected to a lot of different tech stacks, right? They've been trying Python and JavaScript, and they're used to having a few lines of code uh, to start things up. Uh, so, so that's why I find it super exciting that we have minimal API, for example, right? We're able to showcase that five lines of code and you got an API up and running. And, you know, we are going to be talking about API as part of the show, but that's what makes me really proud, right? That we as a uh, .NET uh, folks uh, are able to provide that, you know, just five lines and got something. I've always thought that's interesting uh, and it's always a balance, you know, but we try and, um, let me see. I think I may have given Jeff the wrong link, so I'm doing two things at once. We always try and straddle the line of, you know, we want to be backwards compatible. We want to keep, um, if people are used to being, you know, developing apps, like I've been developing ASP.NET apps for a long time and I want it to still feel familiar, but we don't want it to be stagnant, you know, and so we want to keep adding on and building and learning from the community. And so I always think that's kind of an interesting balance. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I, I've been at it, I think, it, probably as long as you have, right? I started with ASP Classic, Web Forms, ASP MVC. And, and yes, I agree there's a balance to it, right? Because if even if you say, hey, here's five lines of code and it's going to work, but then you got everything else, right? Authentication, authorization, logging. There are still some very interesting problems for you out there to solve, right? So it's not like we're taking away problems. We, we can just focus on different things. Yep. Awesome. All right. Welcome, Jeff. This is, I know you've had a busy morning. Hello. Yep. We were just talking about, and thanks for the raid, um, everybody coming over from Jeff's stream. Uh, we we're just talking about, you know, what, what we do at Microsoft and then also the balance of being backwards compatible, keeping the existing stuff working, but also evolving the framework, continuing sure. to, to learn from what the community is building, um, what, what uh, challenges they're hitting and, and web development is such a, you know, rapidly evolving field. You don't mm. want something super stagnant. So. And I, I think the move first to .NET Core and ASP.NET Core really speaks towards that embracing of, uh, from Microsoft, right? Making that change to something that's open source, something that is aware that it's always changing. There's always things happening. So being able to ship packages that support significant instant package updates, security fixes, new features as they're being developed on the web. That was important that we didn't we didn't stay locked behind Patch Tuesday. Oh uh, right? yeah, yeah. It's it's you know I was looking over something recently that I like a long ago blog post and stuff that I ship with um, MVC Music Store, mm. and you know some thinking back to, wow, before NuGet was a thing, you know, like how difficult and like trying to use open source libraries before there was NuGet, it was like, go download this DLL or go get the source code from Cord CodePlex and, you know. <laughs> okay. All right, Chris, I'm going to show, I'm going to show how old I am for a second. <laughs> I would go down to the Barnes and Noble at lunch and buy the magazine with the CD tape to it because it was yeah. faster for me to get that for six bucks at Barnes and Noble, bring it back and plug in the, the, the CD and download and install the latest version than it was to use the internet and wait for the thing to download. Exactly. Okay, well, so we have a lot of stuff planned. We're gonna be digging into instant APIs. Before we do that, I wanna 
share our community links. I need to update the link list that I'll be sharing. So I've got that here. Uh, I don't like how it wraps, but that's life. Um, I'm also sharing it in the, in the um, list here. And then it'll also be in the show notes on YouTube and stuff if you're watching later. So let's go ahead and get started. So I'll bring up my screen here. I don't have a whole bunch of links. Um, uh, let's let's see what we got. So first of all, hello Podman using .NET. So Podman is interesting. Um, it is so Docker and correct me when I get this wrong here, but Docker is built on top of infrastructure that was already inside of Linux and then has been um, exposed in other operating systems. Well, uh, that. Uh, allows for isolation. So it's basically a lightweight, it's not a full virtual machine um, because it shares system resources, but allows some like abstracting and, and containerizing applications. Um, because of that, you know, ev everyone assumes Docker, but Docker is just kind of more of a pattern. Um, and so Podman is another option for you. So this, this has been around for a while and they recommend, you know, they say you can, in a lot of cases, you can just say alias Docker equals Podman. <laughs> uh, so, um, but so this is, uh, it, you know, and then there are other, there are also like licensing implications and other things with Docker too, right? So it's nice to have those, those, um, the flexibility. So, uh, so here's a great so, question from Tom. On, and, and does it use the similar syntax? Then it does. For, for the Docker file, uh, or do they call it something so, different? I will be I will be honest here. I've done like a deep dive on this over a year ago. Mm, okay, <laughs> I need to forget. So, okay, I believe yes. Maybe someone in the chat can um, can clarify if I'm wrong. But I think that basically the idea is that it is built using the same kind of convention conventions and file awesome. structure and stuff. Yeah, that that's very cool. Always great so, to have an, competition. Uh, yeah, to another neat thing features. here. Exactly, exactly. So another neat thing is that there is an API used for managing the containers. And so what Tom's post digs into here is not actually just um, uh, containerizing using Podman, but actually orchestrating and controlling your applications. So here, this is using um, installing the packages here, and then uh, actually like you know, creating clients and doing things, controlling applications, communicating between them using, <clears throat> using those APIs. So that's pretty cool. It is pretty cool. It's, it's, yeah. it's really, you know, and that's like another next level thing to kind of orchestrate, spin up, can, you know, communicate between them and that sort of stuff. So here he's got things like create container async, et cetera. So uh, chat room, this is, this is when we say, Hey, let's build, let, let's build a WPF app that, that manages Podman container. There you go. Right. Like, yep. There's simple source code to get you there. Yep. Yeah. You're right. I mean, it's just, it's .NET code, right? So yeah. Neat stuff. Um, okay. Uh, we got Niels in the chat. So hello, Niels. Thanks for all the great content you've been creating lately. So this is a post on uh, sending those ASP.NET Core identity emails using Twilio SendGrid. Oh my gosh. So, I, yeah. I always see that message, right? When, it, when, I'm, when I first set up identity, I'm doing a demo. I see that message up at the top. You don't have an email provider configured. So just click here to, uh, to skip through this. You're telling me, John, this tells me exactly how to do that using this is showing, exactly. SendGrid. And you know, a lot of people are not aware of like, there's really pretty advanced, um, the the identity provider stuff in ASP.NET will get you pretty, you know, it handles OAuth, it'll handle mm -hmm. the email account um, restoration and, you know, all that kind of stuff. And so, like you're saying though, part of it is you're gonna need a way to send those emails um, from mm -hmm. your application. Yeah. So, and one of the things that a provider like SendGrid will do for you is get you past those spam filters and like mm -hmm. actually kind of ensure that your emails went out. Like, sure, you can set up an NT, uh, SMTP server somewhere, but does it actually, do the emails get through, you know? And, and right, and there's permission lists, right, that for spam bots and things that you need to manage when you stand up your own SMTP server. Let the folks at SendGrid do that for you. Yep, exactly, yep. And, you know, before I was uh, doing my current job with, I was working with .NET Foundation 
and we had a lot of emails that had to go out and I like was basically managing a small business. Right. And so some of those things where you're actually, you need to like send out emails, make sure they go through, like it's pointless to send out emails if they're not actually going out, you know? And so exactly like having a provider that kind of manages all that, that, stuff all those checkbox things to make sure the emails go out so so, so uh, john is yeah. there like a free tier that, that that i can try this out with or or how does it work if so i want to try i think there was let me see i thought i remembered uh so niels is in the chat maybe niels can answer on that um i thought i remembered seeing that but i can't remember oh ah, i see a send grid get starting get started for free try for free all right. There Big button nice. there at the top of their website. Yeah. So I don't know. There's Maybe probably some more. limitation of yeah. email frequency or something. So so Niels is saying here, 100 emails a day for free. So oh my God. Um, for most accounts, like if you're handling identity login stuff, hopefully you're not having to send over 100 emails a day. No. So, I mean, that could probably get you pretty far with a free account. For sure. So this this walks through configuring the account, setting it up, uh, you know, the configuration stuff on that side. And then, um, of course, you're going to be authenticating with an API key. So you've got to configure that. Um, and then the stuff in the actual application, um, you know, uh, there's a, a package for that. And then just kind of configuring it as your provider to send those emails out. So, um and uh you know as, as niels is saying also good for testing right so as you're going through um you know that's that's pretty handy. it's a good grow up story right so you started with testing okay you're deploying your application small as you start to grow and you outgrow that free trial and and 100 emails of 100 emails a day is a lot yeah um yeah. for a small application you start to outgrow it that's pretty good yeah yeah. So there, you know, this isn't a commercial for, for SendGrid or anything, but it's, it's great to, you know, I, I do love that grow up story. I do love that there yeah. are commercially supported, you know, pretty inexpensive services out there. And I do also want to remind people that this is a feature in ASP.NET Identity, the whole kind of login, forgot password, you know, all that kind of stuff is, is built in. Is is there a an actual yeah there okay there i was going to say is there a new get package there it is add the send grid dependency injected new get package well there yeah. you go a lot of good stuff so. comes back to the topic of hey one line to configure something really cool yep and so i did, i wasn't aware that there are these new get packages out there yeah. so that's that's pretty cool all right just a few more here there was a release of dotnet 7 you know it's like .NET 6 just went out. We're mostly talking about .NET 6, but we're keeping yep. an eye on .NET 7 as the previews start rolling. It, um, right there. And, and it's just laying laying the, the foundation stuff. We're not seeing big features yet, mm -hmm. right? Just the foundation stuff. Yep. And uh, there's, there's that themes of .NET... You want to see the kind of big things that they're shooting for, like the overall, you can look at, you know, like, you know, runtime or whatever, and you can drill in. And now is a time where you can still, um, if you want to see and, and you know, participate in these discussions, now is the time where you can still have some impact on that, right? Mm -hmm. You can see yeah, there's still some things. I actually really like this. There are some things we'll talk about, like back in .NET 5, we're like, hey, we're going to do this thing. And we got a lot of it done. We didn't completely finish it. Well, we don't just throw that off the table. Those are still in the backlogs, still mm -hmm. reevaluated. And now it's the time where you can go in and say, hey, this is really important to me. And, you know, continue to bump these things up. So and I like seeing right there, third item down, ASP.NET performance goals for .NET 6. Yeah. Right above me there. Right. 71% there. Well, guess what they're doing with the other 29%. Yep. Still, still a focus, right? And so, so mm -hmm. this is a time... This is where we're at in that cycle, where it's like those beginning foundational things are shipping, and there's they're still like working on these the what the bigger rocks I think they call them sometimes yeah. right? boulders or nope yeah 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 oops I skipped ahead there let me flip back to here so anyhow uh, in here we've got some things uh, inferring inferring controller action parameters from services so you no no longer have to say from services. 
dependency injection and signal R, et cetera. So, uh, so you can start uh, installing these, you can run them side by side. So there's that. There's also some neat stuff just generally in .NET 7. Um, for instance, the .NET new experiences has improved. Um, there's source generators for regular expressions, which mm. is pretty cool. So I love source generators um, that are actually at build time, they're generating optimized code based on your, your application. So like for instance, regular expression, it can look at that and it can actually build that as optimized code at build time. Um, so that's, that's pretty cool. Um, the, another neat thing to be aware of here is this .NET new experience. So some things like you no longer have to do dash dash all the time. Um, so it's, it's a lot, you know, it's, it's more terse syntax. Um, and then there's tab completion uh, that is more supported. So you can do things yeah. like tab completion on template names. I think I saw something really awesome, John. Could you scroll up to the commands? There were some new commands, right? Install uh, package, .NET install. All right. Oh, the, well, well, so wait, so there's already, there is like dash dash install that you could do before. Yeah. And what's new is you don't have to type that dash dash. So it's been, it's been promoted to a first level command. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. Very nice. Yeah. So, so the thing before is like it, you would say .NET new, and then you'd have to do all these dash dash things to as switches. And now they're more like commands that are built on, which kind of feels more, um, you know, like, because something like here where it's an off, that is a switch, right? But, yeah. or, or that's a parameter you're passing in. But if you're doing something, then I'd, I'd like to just say .NET new update or, or whatever. <clears throat> so so we've gone from .NET verb noun, right? .NET new and some noun, some template that you're passing. .NET new and then another verb and possibly yeah. additional nouns, install, uninstall. Um, I like that update one sitting there. Yeah. That one is always one that I've struggled with. The proper format for it, do I have the appropriate template or package name, uh, uh, tool name that I'm updating. Always, I always have a problem with it. And that's where a tab completion comes in. So I'm excited about that because it's like, really like you're a computer, you can do this for me. Don't make me Google the syntax again. <laughs> I, I like to bingle for it. Yep, there you go. All right, just a few more here that I've got before I turn it over to you folks. Um, Damien's got this repo where he's building minimal API extensions. Mm -hmm. um, so these are, you know, additional binding and an additional just kind of like simplify like parameter binding and, you know, typed I results and things like that. So uh, scroll um, down there. What's the to do APIs dapper right there behind our head to do's right. application using ASP.NET Core minimal APIs in the dapper library for storage. Yeah. So let's park that idea and come back to that. One. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Well, yeah, Bing, meals, Bingle, you know, it's, it, <laughs> you use the Bing, the Microsoft there you Bing. Go. I remember seeing those uh, extension there by Damien. Um, I think there were some interesting ones, right? If you had a stream, for example, you want to download that uh, by decorating it, uh, I thought it made things easier, right? Is yeah. Like, so, I have so a body, there's... I want to turn it into a byte array or whatever, right? Yeah, and uh, the one that's in this new release here is binding of a to body T body. So you can exactly that what you were just saying there. So very, uh, you know, just simplified binding to to a body. Um, yeah. So cool stuff. Um, you know, Damien always, uh, that's something, uh, you know, it's cool that he's always building stuff like this. He's got his tag helpers pack. He's got a lot of other things out there. And I really appreciate that he's constantly building on top of the APIs. And then when he hits a something that bugs him about it, he'll like say, "We got to fix this," you know. And so I, I mm -hmm. love that he's specifically still continuing to build stuff on here. Oh, definitely. Um, so just a few others here. So I'm I'm basically turning over to you folks. Um, Chris I recognize this article. <laughs> so Chris and Jeff both built some cool stuff at the same time, and then merged them kind of together. And so um, so Chris, you had built this thing where you're using a JSON file to basically mock out, you're saying, here's a product, here's some sample data, and then let's build 
minimal APIs on top of that, right? And then... Yeah, for sure. I mean, uh, I think where I was coming from is that I think I've, I saw this in other ecosystem for other languages and frameworks. I'm thinking to myself, why can't I have a mock server, you know? And, and usually you, you kind of start out, you don't have that code yet. And maybe I'm working on a React client or, you know, Angular, wh whatever have you, right? Mm -hmm. and, and I'm thinking, or, or there's some, some other team that I'm waiting for, right? I'm waiting for them to build me that pizza API so I can start using it, but I don't have it yet. But I, exactly. I, yep. You know. And then, so then you end up writing throwaway code where you just say, return this, return that. And it's maybe not even valid code, you know, and then maybe your test API is not even correct and you're building clients on top of it, or you're working in a team and one team is setting up the database and blah, 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 doing all that stuff. And then the other person's building the client. So it's great to be able to spin up a, a client like this very, very quickly. Mm hmm Definitely. And then Jeff, you were working on this instant APIs and yeah. it was really fun when you chatted me, you're like, John, tell me I'm not crazy. This seems really cool. <laughs> so <laughs> we were looking at it. I was like, whoa, this is awesome. So Chris was, was coming into the exact same problem that, that I was talking to with, with our friend, uh, James Montemagno, that mm -hmm. we've got these APIs and I keep rebuilding them again and again and again for those same five methods. The, the create, read, update, delete, and read by ID, right? Or get by ID. I was like, I don't like constantly rewriting these in all of my minimal API demos because I was I was prepping demos for an event. And I'm like, why am I retyping these same five methods over and over and over? So what if we could just generate them? The exact same problem that Chris is solving. I, I've got a shape. I've got here, look, I've got contacts and addresses. Scroll up just a smidge there, John, right. to, to the EF context. Yeah, that right there. I, I've got contacts and addresses and I know they're stored in a table in the database. I have this entity framework context and just go generate those 10 APIs, five for each of the tables for me. And that's where this idea of instant APIs came from. Just add entity framework and boom, there it is. And so I, you know, it's always interesting with these, there's always a balance of some people going like, this is great. I totally see it. I love it. And then there yeah. are, there's always some other people that are like, this is bad. It's going to generate yeah. inefficient code. People yeah. are going to build all their stuff on it, whatever. Yeah. I, so I love the idea of like, it can be prototype, it can get you started, and then you can evolve it, you can optimize it, you can build on top of it. Yeah. But you don't, for a lot of CRUD applications, there's no business value in writing. Highly know, optimized code. code. <laughs> you know? Right. Yeah. So, and, and this is where I, I wrote a, a similar blog post on DevTO. And, and when I posted it, like I go through and read it, does everything look right in it? hey, what's this article from Chris? And I reached out to Chris. I said, hey, Chris, we're solving the same problem here, just coming from two sides. And, and to Chris's credit, he put on the end of his article, hey, is this something that folks would be interested in? I can put it in a package somewhere. And I reached out and said, why don't we pull these two pieces together and let's make it one library. And if you want to do this right here, just above John and I's head here, if you want to do this for an entity framework context, Boom, one command and it's wired up. And if you scroll down further in the readme, Chris copied in his code and there's there's the configuration. If you keep scrolling down, um, pass that one. Here you go, JSON-based APIs. Here's Chris's stuff that you can add, add your JSON file and you can scroll down a little bit further and you can add it in. It'll generate all these APIs for you and you can do the same thing. There's one line to add this now, eh, we got to get rid of Fritz in front of these. I name all my packages after myself. I'm kind of, kind of selfish like that. But um, just a little bit further down here, you'll see the the command. There it is. Use JSON routes. Done. So the similarity here is both of these have a defined data structure. One is JSON. The other is Entity Framework yep. DB Context, and then. That's defined. It's spelled out. So why not just generate something from that? And then you, you're generating these routes pointing out from that. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. David on YouTube chat. <laughs> yep. Let yep. me take you one step further here, right? Uh, gosh, and, and Chris doing all the figuring out for the JSON stuff. Speaking of JSON stuff, Jason Bach 
one of our MVPs, friend in the developer community, took yep. this and said, Fritz, you're doing all this reflection. We can make this faster. And he I, wrote a code I see he's watching right now, too. That's cool. He wrote a code generator, right? So you've seen code generators for JSON serialization and, and now regex. We're talking about .NET 7. There's a, so now if you scroll back up, it's the middle element there in the readme. There's a code generator that you can run so that when you build, um, it'll include, uh, it, nope, you scrolled just past it. I'm, uh, I'm sorry. See. see, I gotta, I gotta work on the documentation for this. We gotta help. Oh, out no, I thought I'd be smart and search, but uh... just, there you go. Source generator approach. Yeah. And now map my context to APIs. You see it right there. Mm -hmm. that'll take your context that you define in the assembly attribute and generate the exact same APIs. It'll write the code to disk instead of doing a little bit of reflection to go uh, and find the things. We, to, to Jason's credit, he took what's about 300 milliseconds to run each one of the reflection-based APIs. It's now down to like 30 milliseconds. And they're all, they're all as, as David and YouTube pointed out, they're all those... The, the simple, hey, just put this thing in the API, in, in the database, or grab, you know, that collection of contacts or, or pizzas or whatever it is, and just mm -hmm. dump it out. Why not just do it with one or two lines of code and generate the rest? Mm, is nice. it is it a good idea? Is it a great idea? <laughs> you know what? To, to exactly what you said, John, it means we can write how much less code. Is it is it going to replace GraphQL or or... Uh, what's it called? O data? No, no. And there's people that that when we when I shared the initial blog post about this, they said, "Oh, it's O data again." You know, this was a bad idea ten years ago. It's a bad idea now. Like, you don't have to use this. It's it's a NuGet package that's off on the side. If it gets people to like Chris was saying, if it if it gets people prototyped and gets you in and running faster, so that you do swap in the production thing later, great. Mm -hmm. Great. So interesting question from David, and I think this hopefully goes to uh, like a problem that's solved by Entity Framework, right? So the question is, will it work with related tables and foreign keys? So if I've got a DB context, is it able to kind of figure that out? It, it does not do anything with related tables right now. Okay. <clears throat> it, it's strictly one table and generate those, those five methods for it. Okay. Now, can I extend on top of it? Can I generate those and then write additional APIs that sure. are like, now go get this for that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So there's, there are hooks in this, so it'll generate all the swagger endpoints. Um, we need to actually tune that. It's not, it's a little bit aggressive at activating and turning on swagger right now, but um, we do want to tune that, make it a little bit easier for folks to use. Once those are out there, when you go and add, Add your own controllers if you have more complex APIs. Add your own extensions to go and, and do different business logic. Sure. You, you've already got the simple solutions already solved. Go do another thing. So another question here, and I think how I'm reading the code, the answer is yes, because this is, you're telling it scaffold this DB set or scaffold this thing. Mm -hmm. So you don't have to scaffold your entire context. You can scaffold out specific DB sets. Is that true? That's right. So if you if you scroll up a little bit in the documentation, there is an entry about the configuration. There it is. So you can say, include this table, contacts, generate all the methods, and here's the base URI name, address book that you want to use. So there we're creating, we're, we're going to generate just the contacts APIs, and we're going to generate all five of the APIs, but you can certainly come through and use and say, well, you know what? Generate just the two read uh, endpoints because those are anonymous. That's okay. There's nothing really that we need to do that's interesting there. And done. It makes it real easy to put that with, what, two lines of code? I'm not including the curly braces as another line of code. And you've, you've built those APIs without having to write connections into your entity framework context and all that stuff. So I think it's... I think it's a, a good way to optimize folks workflow, get you started. Cool. Okay. So, so um, right now this is an experiment and it's an open yep. source project. It's something yep. you, you folks are working on. The two things I was hoping we could do is one um, 
you can have you take turns. Like uh, Chris has to leave a little bit earlier, so I wanted to turn it over to him. Sure. And we could take a look at like the two things I, I'm hoping to see is one, show me like some demos of how you'd use it. Show me some, it can just be source code or whatever, but show me how you'd use it. And then also I'm interested in your experience on building on top of minimal APIs. Like, oh, yeah. you know what I mean? So two things, how do we use your project? And two, how did you build your project? Sure. So, all right. Cool. All right, Chris, do you want to share your screen or do you? Yeah, for sure. One, one second here. Um... Hopefully you can see my screen as we speak. Yep, I see it. You ready for me to add? There we go. Yep, yep, should be good. Yeah, so this is the root file, right? <clears throat> uh, I believe we've been seeing this one before, the README, but I just wanted to take you all through it. So um, just to reiterate, uh, what we are looking at is you creating this JSON file. You could be calling it products, customers, address book, whatever you want to call it, right? And let, let's just keep in mind all the different HTTP verbs that we support currently, which are two different gets. I think, Jeff, you alluded to it, one mm -hmm. normal get and one get by ID, right? Mm -hmm. And then we're supporting post, delete, uh, and, and so on. Uh, what I'm working on uh, right now is to support the put one. But uh, one of the questions, John, that you had was, how do I actually get started to use this? Well, the instructions for starting to use it, see if I am in the right place. Do, 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 do. No, uh, you were just pa past it. There it was JSON based API. There you go. Uh, do, do, do. Just a little bit. There it is. There we go. So um, the first thing you need to do, so either you generate a minimal API project, this is the code for doing that, or you already have a minimal API, in which case you could be using that. Uh, right now, uh, Jeff has put this on Nougat, so you can definitely grab it from there. Um, for now, it's called Fritz. Uh, might be called something else in the future, right, Jeff? Absolutely. Yeah, we're looking to drop that just so it's instant APIs. Right. And and per what you all mentioned before, uh, it's a NuGet package, which makes it really, really sweet to, to get started with. So we grab that package from NuGet. Once we have that package, uh, we're able to, to actually use it. And the way to use it is to refer to it by its namespace. Now, by having that namespace, that gives us this extension method. Once we have that extension method called use JSON routes, it will actually crawl through your application instance and it will keep uh, adding things to it. So, so that's really all there is to it. And I, uh, I believe it's still expecting the mock file to be called mock.json unless Jeff, you have been programming that a little bit. Um, I added Maybe. to the config, that's a default name and you can rename it to something else if you'd like. Oh, nice, very nice. So uh, yeah, I, I just wanted to go quickly through to see what uh, kind of black magic that we're actually using to get all of this to work. It's, it's not really that complicated, but what we're trying to show you all today is how by producing these kind of tools and these kind of APIs, we do some heavy lifting for you so you can focus on that business value, right? Of adding more types of pizzas or, or contacts in your address book, whatever have you, right? So yeah, it, it definitely crawls through different methods uh, for insert, for get. You can see here how uh, I believe, Jeff, you have been making this a bit nicer or was it me? I can't remember right now. I think I think you did that initial formatting. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. It's good, good that you have my my extra memory here. But yeah, as you can see, there is a to-do spot here for the put, but everything else is supported from delete to two different gets to post. And yeah, I mean, it's a JSON mock file. We're reading that in and it's able to just go through and do what it needs to do to add the things uh, to the API, uh, sorry, a application instance. So that's really the name of the game. So if you look at one of these lines here, you can see that this is the way that you normally set up a route, right? You call the application instance, you call map delete or map post, whatever you're trying to do, and you associate it with some kind of route pattern and some kind of method, uh, you know, that that's handling that request. So that's really uh, everything that goes on under the hood. But yeah, uh, John, did you have a specific question on this? Well, so one was there's a question on why are we using the term mock? Um, so I actually, you know, um, brought, th this is the common computer science term that they use for this, right? This is a, a mock is an object that simulates a real object. So 
yeah and, yeah for sure and 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 i mean uh, that that was the uh, name i chose for that very uh, reason john right to to just say mm -hmm. hey mark this is not the real thing so some kind of wording that says this is not actually coming from a database right yeah yeah so cool um yeah and then uh david was just saying hey i'd like to work on this and you know this it is an open source project so this is yep. something where so jeff <laughs> it's funny we were joking about this the other day before contributing a big change probably making it like have a comment on an issue first right <laughs> yeah right and it kind of a um a good open source etiquette to create an issue talk about that with some of the folks that are working on the project and send a pull request that that addresses just that issue mm -hmm. um there there is a pull request out there um developer did a, a ton of great work really nice stuff um to improve configuration add the ability to work with a repository object so even if you're not working with a database have a repository that you're interacting with that has definitions of the various tables and things maybe you want to hand off to some other storage mechanism really mm -hmm. cool but they went and literally touched the entire project and changed and modified things and that's not something that allows contributors like chris and myself to review and say, well, we like this piece and we don't like that piece. We want to accept this feature. We don't want that feature. We want to talk further about this. <clears throat> we think it needs a little bit more capabilities. It, it's, hey, I rewrote your entire application for you. What yeah. do you think? Like, yeah. That, yeah, that's a comment. You know, it's funny because I, I contribute some to the .NET website and I'll, I'll find that. I'll be going through and I'll fix something. I'll, I'll be working on my specific thing and then I'll like, uh, this service class bugs me. I'll just do, and then I'll be like partway through a rewrite. I'm like, that's not part of this. Stash mm -hmm. that change. Let's go back. You know, focus yeah. because it's you want to write pull requests that are easy to review and accept, right? So, exactly. And start with a start with an issue first to say, hey, I feel like we should support repository objects. Here's how I'm thinking we should do it. Sound yep. good, you know, and then, yep. you know, I'm working on a pull request to address this issue. That kind you, of you're contributing. You're not taking ownership of. Yeah. yeah. So important to have that in mind as you're working with this. So cool. so one thing we can do, though, Jeff, is to maybe create the first uh, few issues, right? If you're new to open source, maybe we can say, hey, this is a good first issue. Maybe it's a uh, help with documentation yes. or one, one line of code, mm -hmm. I'm thinking. Mm -hmm. So it, we do have a documentation site that, that started up and we want to put some samples out there and make it real easy. It, it's literally a copy of the readme at this point, but okay. it's out there. If you click into the project in GitHub, there's a, a little bubble, little link right at the top of the readme that's docs and it'll jump you right to the docs site. So we have, we have some place for that to land. And we'll add some features there. We'll add some samples to make it clear how to exercise and take advantage of some of these features. Because it, as, and, and I realized, Chris, it, it, as you were scrolling through the code there, I thought it was just the reformat. I forgot. I added the ability to control which methods were generated. I, I added that in there. Nice. So, Very nice. Yeah. So, so on my part, I'm definitely looking to add things around query params and put. So if you feel like, Hey, I want to help with this, you know, definitely reach out. Uh, I'm on Twitter. So my IMs are open. Of course, me and Jeff is going to have a chat about this. Mm -hmm. See, is this the right thing, thing to build? We mm -hmm. definitely welcome uh, no contributors, but as both John and Jeff were saying, maybe don't rewrite the whole repo. We definitely want you on board though. Yeah. It's... Or, or you can just, like you know, Twitter definitely works, or you can just directly open an issue. I see there's what 16 issues open, so there's lively discussion going on. And yeah, it, right. And the the idea was to do something simple. This is the getting started, right? Just like you can scaffold entity framework, you can scaffold parts of your website. The idea that I think both Chris and I came into this with was, I just need some data. Give me some yeah. data. I want to. I want to build a Blazor website. I want to build an Angular website, and I need an API for this. I don't want to go through all the nonsense of it. Just generate that. And there's folks that have requested ways to inject business logic or authentication. And and it, the way that we've kind of talked about this is at the point that you're adding all those features, it's not a minimal API anymore. Uh -huh. You you've added enough things that. Okay, now it's time to branch off and customize and do your business logic somewhere else. Yeah, 
Yeah, I do like that now because I was thinking back, you know, there's there's all these generators and it's very tempting as a computer programmer to, oh, I can use, I can write some logic to generate all this stuff. So I'm mm -hmm. thinking back to dynamic data and subsonic and, you know, a bunch of other projects oh gosh, out yes. there that would do that. What's nice with this is that you're working at an API level already. So there's a really clear abstraction of, great, great you want to generate a blazer layer or whatever on top of that, why not point it at the swagger? You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And so you you work up to the level of the API. That's a pretty clear place to kind of draw the line of Absolutely. what you want to build, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I think... Um... There's other things that that I've created issues for. Hey, it'd be great to put a GraphQL interface in front of these with mm -hmm. just a line or two of configuration. It'd be it'd be cool. It, we did open API wire up. We um, it, there's other configuration tricks and things that hey, it makes sense to to add these in so we can generate pretty easily, right? Not just the open API stuff, but how do we generate and put some of the configuration. Um, documentation into that as well. Okay, you know, there's work that we can do there. There's definitely documentation features. We want to make it easy for folks to get started. And, and I think there's a great demo. I'm, I'm sorry, I, I interrupted. I'll tell well, you about my I, demo. I had a tiny thing to jump in. And then if you're if you're talking about demos, happy to see any demos you, you want to show off or, or, or whatever. But um, one Let's thing demo I on say, the fly. How's that? Yeah, let's do it. Okay, okay. but first... One thing that I've noticed when I'm looking at minimal API mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. the Swagger stuff specifically, there's support for a lot of things, but you have to type it in, like things like tagging and stuff like that for, for the open API support. And yeah. I'm curious if, if there's some more that you folks could do with that, if you can infer like, I don't know, I guess that gets a little tougher because a lot of those things require some sort of knowledge. Like if you're going to tag an API, yeah, I don't know. Interesting. Go on. <laughs> And well, I'm, I'm beginning to look like Ming the Merciless over here. Jeff. Yeah, exactly. I, I just noticed when I was playing with the minimal API, mm -hmm. open API support, mm -hmm. there, it was like, now we support this, we support this. Yeah. Here's the line of code you have to type. Here's the line of code you have to type. And then those seem like some of the things we're generating some additional stuff sounds nice. Uh, I think I, I think there's an opportunity to add in, right? It, I, 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 I think you both know this feature in open API. If you generate the XML documents from your C sharp app, there's a way in open API in the open API scaffolder to bring in that documentation and add it into your, your swagger output. Yeah. Maybe that's something that we can light up quickly with a mm -hmm. configuration option that, Hey, go turn this on in your project and put this into your, uh, uh, instant APIs config and we'll automatically wire all that up for you. Sure. Yeah. That absolutely could be a thing to get at least the comments on your objects, right? And on your, yeah. Yeah. at least get that bit into the mix. What's after that though? Yeah. I don't know. All, all right. right. So let, let's see some, let's see some crazy. You, you want to see me write some live code on the fly. Let sure. Me, why not? Let me move <laughs> some things around here. I've got to move. Um, move that over here. I'm going to open this. Uh, how do we feel about Visual Studio Code? Do you know about this tool called Visual Studio Code? Have you heard of it? Once or twice. I think Once I've, got a, I've a got a few of them installed. I think I'm working hard on the notepad, though. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> hey, right. I was working in Vim earlier today building with, uh, uh, building with Blazor and Azure Functions. That wow. was a thing. And you um, managed to quit the uh, Vim as well. Yeah, you just yes, re I restart did. the computer. That's why you took a while to join the stream, Jeff. You're That's right. <laughs> let's go into. Let's create a folder here for ASP.NET standup. Let's. Uh, I. I'm feeling. I'm feeling a little ambitious here. Let's do a. Let's generate a database first. Okay. And then reverse generate reverse engineer. A website from it. I think that'll be cool. Let's do that. Let's create a new folder here and let's call this, uh, we'll do .NET new. I'm going to create in, um, let's create a new, I don't want a web. Let's create a new MVC application just because I can put um, entity framework in that quickly. So I'm going to create a new MVC application and let's output this and let's call this the base application. I don't care. I'm going to end up removing this in a minute. So creating a new MVC application, .NET 6 loaded. It's out there. I'm going to go 
let's open Visual Studio Code. Da, 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 da. Visual Studio Code, you're here. You're installed on this machine. I'm looking to find you. Taking its good time starting. There we go. It's gone plaid. No. <laughs> um, all right, here we go. You go away. Thank you. Inside that base folder, we have everything to build an ASP.NET Core application with MVC. I don't really care. I'm going to use this to build and create an entity framework context to generate a SQL Lite database that I'm going to reverse engineer and with one line of code, create a complete set of APIs based on that SQL Lite database. The idea, what I'm trying to mimic here is the concept of you already have a database sitting out there. It's sitting in SQL Server. It might be sitting in Azure SQL or MySQL somewhere. Maybe it's even inside of a Docker container. Do we do that around here? Databases and Docker containers? Sometimes. Right. Sometimes. I think, we do. I think there's <laughs> an image awesome. for uh, SQL Server, right? I mean, to yeah. Docker. Yep. Um, so I'm going to builder. I want to do builder services. This is running really slow because of, I'm using StreamYard, and StreamYard yeah. starts to crawl things on my machine. All that screen sharing. Right. Need processors. Yeah. Need all the processors. Let me see if I can help things out here. Um, I want to add SQLite. And I think it's, is it database? Uh, database? Uh, and let's call this, uh, let's call this pizza.db, right? Something like that. Do I have that right? You make him hungry. I think you can just give it the file name. I don't even think you have to name it. Am I that lucky? Um, give me a second here. Let me bring up some code on another screen. Uh, one second. So, to, to, while you're doing that, Andy had mm -hmm. a question about be nice to do this without reflection. And I think one thing you pointed out is that the what Jason Bach created was this um, was a was a source generator based thing. So it's not exactly using reflection for that. Yep. So add uh, should be one word like that. No, I don't want to introduce a local. Um, I need a using statement for this, don't I? Oh, ho, 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 ho. one second, one second. We will go grab this. I have code already written that does this. Yes, I need a using statement. Using Microsoft Entity Framework Core. And I probably have to add that, don't I? That's fine. Let's do a... And I think it, I think what I'm seeing in some sample code is instead of, it doesn't say data store, it says data source. Yes, I, I, I did I, oh shoot, wrong name. Thank you. Yeah. See that pair programming. <laughs> uh, Entity Framework Core SQLite, I think is the name of the package. See I'm impressed that, that you know the full name of the package just by heart. <laughs> <sighs> I think John knows, I've, I've done this once or twice. <laughs> All right, so there we go. It doesn't know what pizza store is. Let's create a class called pizza store. I'm going to even create it in this file. And I'm going to make this a DB context. Thank you so much. Um, we want to have toppings, right? So let's create a public property here. It's going to be a DB set of something called toppings. And we'll call this toppings. And uh, what is it? I forget. It is... Go grab the exact syntax that I have for this. There we go. Not base. It is going to be set of something called a topping. Thanks so much. We need to create what a topping is. That's fine. Keep it in this file because it's easy. And I'm going to create a property. Oh, uh, public int ID. Yes, please. And let's create a name for that topping. Cool, so now I have toppings. Uh, and let's create a one more DB set for something called specials, right? Uh, yeah, specials set for a special, all right? And we'll define a special real quick with actually the exact same properties. Thank you. In the same file, uh, public int ID, 
and a public string called name. Cool. All right. Um, and I need to add a constructor option here. It's kind of a thing. You need a constructor. That's not the constructor. Uh, this should probably be a public class, and I'm guessing these need to be public also because we're going to access them from outside. Yes. Public pizza store, and it needs to take the DB context options, right? For a pizza store. Thank you so much. And um, base options. Fantastic. Don't need to do anything else. Now it knows how to create and generate those. If I drop back down here and we do .NET build, this should build on the fly. Here we go. We'll have, it knows how to build the application. And uh, top level statements must precede, oh, I gotta take, I gotta take all these classes to the bottom of the file. Mm, yeah. Right. Do that one more time. And then we're going to do a .NET Entity Framework Context database update. And we're actually going to generate this file on disk for that database, for our Entity Framework Context. So let's do .NET EF. Uh, well, I'm going to do migrations add first. And then we'll do .NET EF database update. And we'll actually write that database on disk. And then we're going to lift the database. And with two commands, one line of code, we'll have a complete set of this. Uh, your startup project base does not reference yeah, entity framework code design. Oh, uh, you know, that's so nice that you told me what it is because now I can that just say- That is nice at least, yeah. One step nicer would be as if it said, would you like me to add this package? <laughs> oh, love that idea, John. What a great idea. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, would be nice to add a provider so a person can use data that is not even databases. Andy, we're working on that. We're absolutely working on that. There we go. So I have a migration sitting out there now that'll generate the database. So now I can do .NET EF database update and I have a database, right? Hey, John, curious, do we have a, um, any template option where you get EF just by scaffolding, like new MVC or new API and I get EF yes. with it? Yeah, so the trick that I use for this is if you create a database or if you create a project with identity, That's then it is. will create a database for you and it'll add all those packages because it needs a database to store the, the usernames and stuff. So that's the trick I usually use. So I'm going to create a new one here and I'm going to call this uh, my, my Pizza APIs. So to... to to sum up what you've done so far, yep. you created a kind of a dummy application just to scaffold, to create a database. You got you it. filled up a database. So I'm going to go into my pizza APIs and I'm going to copy out of the base folder. And I did that literally just so I could create that database, which was pizza DB. Copy that here locally. Now, right, and if we take a look at that project, Right, so here's my pizza APIs. It has pizza DB in it, it has program CS in it, and literally program CS is four lines of code at this point. That's kind of lame. Um, but Entity Framework has the ability to reverse engineer a uh, Entity Framework context based on a database. So if we do .NET EF, check this out, right? Not a lot of folks use this feature. So .NET EF, I can say uh, database, uh, or is it DB context, I believe. We take a look at the messages on that. We can scaffold a DB context for types of a database. Hold on to your phone there. What? So now we have all these options. We have to provide the connection string to the database. The provider to use, piece of cake, we can go grab that. We need to add that provider though. So let's .NET add package, Microsoft Entity Framework Core SQLite, right? That's all added, cool. And now I'm going to specify and make sure I get the order right. It is uh, connection and then provider. So the connection string to the database or the and the provider to use. So we're gonna say data source, I think it was equals. 
mm-hmm. Pizza DB, and it is going to be Microsoft Entity Framework Core dot SQLite. Hold on to your butts. Let's see if I get this right first time. Um, build started. Yes. It'd be nice if it worked. If you didn't, they all. It'd be nice if you didn't have to type Microsoft at any framework core dot, and you just said SQLite. Oh I'm sorry. God. I'm just. <laughs> you, you're you're onto something there, right? I'm getting minimal today. I forgot the design package. Let me go yep. bring that back in. Now we'll go and scaffold one more time, and hopefully we get it this time. Build succeeded. Yeah. Back over here into. And we now have a pizza context. Nice. And it's got all the things in it and all the stuff to go and connect and use SQL Lightning. It knows how to do the things. So now, right, I can take this, go back over to program, uh, wrong program. That's the other one. That's the one we started with. You can go away. So now inside of here, I can um, up here say, uh, builder services add SQLite, right? Um, data source equals pizza DB. Um, and I need to add my instant APIs. Josh is wishing he knew about scaffolding out here. <laughs> you have context <laughs> last week. <laughs> right. 35 tables. Wow. Yeah. Um, so .NET add package Fritz instant APIs. Pretty sure. So he's also asking, does it include all the indexes and keys and stuff too? Pretty yes. sure it does, right? Those are mm-hmm. your primary keys. And stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, here, take a look. So um, special and toppings and those objects are right out here. Now that is an ID. It generates it as a primary key. But if you did have those keys and things, foreign keys, indexes defined in the database, it will generate appropriate markup for those. Um, Otherwise it assumes ID as a primary key. Exactly. Um, Is it going to, there it is. And if I've done this right, um, let's do this. Before I get too far here, um, (laughs) I believe I need that. No, I already did that. Let's .NET run. See if it works. Hold on to your butts. Nope, I missed something. Uh, Type argument for method add SQL light. Um, What did I miss? Builder services cannot be inferred for the usage. Oh. I forgot pizza context. Mm-hmm. Do it again. So, um, does not contain a definition for, oh. Ah. This is what I get for working without a, without a net. No. Yeah, yeah, people are impressed you're doing this with no Google, though. Is- no Google, no uh, type ahead. There we go. Did you see it? Look at this. Look at this. That is it's, it reports... I created these APIs. I created special specials, all of these things. And it knows how to work with toppings also with all of those methods. Let's head out to the website and take a look. Um, and I've got two Oh, I did methods. the confetti too early. Now it's the confetti. There's the confetti. There we, there we go. go. All Every created. time a demo passes, big demo pass, I got to throw it. It knows back. what specials and toppings are. So we can start We start adding things. Like if I want to add, let's add some toppings into my database, right? Let's try it out. Uh, ID short, and let's call this uh, pepperoni. Let's add that. And looks good. Came back properly. And if we go and say, we'll go get all of my toppings. And it found pepperoni. So we can go and and start building this out, adding those things. And I've got a little database on disk that has that content, right? I have the ability to interact and and get this content. And I've written one line of code inside this application. And of course, get by ID works the same way. And there's my one pepperoni. Okay. 
so what did we learn? Where do we go? What does this mean for us? Right. And I wrote all that code. See, I feel like I should have that base project or that database sitting out there by default, you know? You know, I think that's, a, that's an interesting, cause for people that are watching close, the second half was really an instant APIs part. I think yes. it was interesting actually to watch writing by hand, a quick application. But if you just start with here's pizza DB, you've got your application. This is the code you have to write for that application right there. Absolutely. Hey, can we go to that question from Shane? Uh, you, this one right here? Yeah. What about MySQL? What about any other database provider? Great question, Shane. I'm glad you asked that. Um, so, let, right, let's, uh, what's the MySQL provider uh, on, on NuGet? Um, it's not MySQL Entity Framework Core. It is uh, Pomelo Entity Framework Core my, MySQL. So uh, uh, let's do .NET Add Package. Uh, Pomelo Entity Framework Core MySQL. And with this in, there it is, adding that. So I don't have a MySQL database here. But let's assume, let's just guess for a second and that I do have it available, that I do have it sitting out there. Um, I believe what I'm able to do, where is it? I'm just making sure I have the right syntax here. Uh, da -da 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 -da. Um, I believe what I can do now is instead of saying add SQL light, um, hey, you go away down there. Uh, services, I believe it's add my SQL, and then I can point to my API, my context. Uh, no, pizza context, and whatever, right? Connection string, and it will now go and use my SQL to connect and interact with and map all that data. I'm using just another database. I can do this also with SQL Server and Oracle and all those relational databases that we know and love. This is wired up. This is possible. And that's actually something we can add as an issue, right? If people mm -hmm. wanna help us with documentation. Sure, mm -hmm. right? If you wanna add a little bit of documentation, well, how do I do this with another database? Here's here's the provider we recommend and, and the statements that you would use instead, so. It, it, yeah, and, and sample code, like here's a here's a quick EF sample, whatever. I think it, and the neat thing that you're showing there, that's an advantage or, you know, that's, yeah, that's an advantage of the abstraction of entity framework, right? Mm -hmm. Is that, that once all you need is, Here's the package to add. Here's the connection string, and and you're off to the races. It's Absolutely. Um, can we go to a couple more questions here in chat? Do you mind? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, um, let me. Rinse. I'm going to go up to David here from YouTube. Jot tokens. Um, yeah. What about jot tokens? <laughs> there we, there go. we go. So great question. What if we could generate and turn on authorization? Not just auth right authentication happens somewhere else. What if we could turn on authorization with this? Um, so it, our friend Christos on the 425 show does a lot of talk about how, how to set up identity with your applications. He's actually taken that, uh, that issue and is working on how can we generate authorization automatically for this using Java web tokens, right? It, Jots are, are easy for folks to interact with. It's a question of, well, how do we hook them up to the generated APIs? So he's taking a look at that. That's a feature that we're really looking forward to adding because then if you've already got authentication inside your, your application and you just need to add a couple APIs, lighting it up could be as easy as just saying add instant APIs, config, config dot, and right, uh, I, I don't have the config options popping up here, but be able to say config dot, uh authorize yeah. and whatever the table name is go do the thing so yeah we we really like that idea coming soon much more than simple authorization for a role or a policy is is beyond what we're trying to accomplish here my vision is just like like chris was saying i've got a blazer application i've got an angular application and i just need data I, I, I drink, have a database. I, There's your. Uh, I dropped a link to to the authorization, like in the in the docs and stuff. Yeah, um, yeah. So it's just a few lines of code for that. So 
Yep. It's easy to add on, and that's something for these instant APIs. We're going to light up. We're going to make this easy for folks to do. Um, interesting question here on, like, additional extension, adding controllers for an endpoint sure. or additional business logic. So you, you were just kind of talking about that, but, like, how do you go if, okay, say I want additional business logic, what do I do? You're writing your own API at this point. You, you've, okay. you've exited where we're giving that simple interaction with a with a JSON file or, or a database. You, and I think okay, that's so, an okay line to draw. So let's say, though, um, let's say I want, everything's fine, but I mm -hmm. want to do additional validation logic for the post method. Sure. So I could still say map instant APIs, don't do them all, do them for these data sets or whatever, right? Then yep. I can go through and say, don't configure these specific ones. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's actually the config is over on this one is what ah, I was right. thinking of. So, uh, or maybe not, maybe it's not gonna pop up for me. Thanks so much. <laughs> um, I'm kind of curious though, uh, do we have a mission to support controller-based APIs? I mean, currently, Minimal API mm -hmm. is all the things, right? I'm, I'm yeah. kind of wondering if our audience is interested in having this work for control based. I've I've been thinking about that a little bit more lately too, because for instance, with the um, I I've been updating the ASP.NET um, the workshop, and uh, that one is complicated enough where I actually think it makes more sense to use controllers for that one. Um, and I, you see so many, you know, like everything you see lately is all minimal, minimal. But once you get to a 400 line, you know, <laughs> like minimal API, no, it's not so minimal API no, anymore. No. And those controllers kind of do make sense at that point. They do. And I, I think that's a grow up story coming out of this, right? How do I, how do I generate that code that, okay, this was working this way. Is there, is there a .NET command line tool that we can run that'll take, well, here's what I had as a minimal API and, and generate, generate controllers. There's your grow up story. There's your handoff and now go and add in your features. It, it's, it's nice to be able to like, so there's a few things with that. One is you can say, generate the instant APIs for everything except this or that. Or there's also the thing where you kind of like overlay on top of it. So you mm -hmm. say like, turn on minimal APIs, However, I want to override the, the minimal API for the, you know, for this um, context, or sorry, for this DB set with this, That's you know, verb is. or whatever. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, There's also this uh, this idea of putting a filter on top of the API. So absolutely, the business logic is tacked in front or behind, um, which is kind of nice. That's more like the middleware style approach, right? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. No, I don't want DB. DB no more nice. Um, and it's yeah, it's not giving it to me. If I'm gonna say go give me the toppings, I, I think I'm missing a. Am I missing? No, I think I'm. I was. I thought I was missing a using statement. Uh, hmm. but there's API methods to generate, and if I just want the get for this, and we want to put that somewhere else instead of on toppings, let's call this on uh stuff on my pizza i don't know right um i adding that no i already did that means that i now have some of that control that you're suggesting well i only want this and now i want to overlay on top of it some of these other features um ta -ta 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 -ta. oh the add my sequel is still in here sorry right Right. I uncommented that. Why didn't you turn? Yeah, that's interesting. How'd I do that? Um, I'm missing API methods to generate. Yeah, I do need the using. I knew there was a using I was missing. Ah. Uh, no, just that. There you go. So, right, this gets you to the point of um, and generate. There they go. See that in the log. Uh, get stuff on my pizza. That's the only one that it included. So now when I go back out to that website, right? Uh, swagger. 
So it, it isn't the grow up story of here it is inside of a controller, but mm -hmm. I, I can, I've configured, I can still do this. It's going to get that set of toppings. There's my pepperoni. And I can write, I need to add more features to the, it, like you're saying, to the get or, or uh, well, I only got put the get, but to the post or put. Fine. You've pulled them out of the minimal API generation and overlay and add your appropriate call up in here. So then down at the bottom, you'd say map get whatever or map post, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And then you could say, um, it seems like from watching this that, it would be nice to say generate all except you know oh, <laughs> generate yeah. everything but get because mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um because then that makes it simpler to override a specific one instead of having the, the small one yeah oh my gosh yes right so um and and right you're gonna do whatever your logic is in here it's mm -hmm. the same five lines everybody writes but um, you want to turn around, you want to say, generate all of those except for, oh, John, if I got a feature for you. Oh, let's see it. Oh, there you go. Yeah. That's exactly the thing, right? <laughs> right. So I don't need all those other things. And if I go back down here, restart. Um, oh, I spelled it wrong. Come on, IntelliSense. I, <laughs> help me, Obi-Wan, Obi IntelliSense, IntelliSense-y. You're my only oh, hope. Yeah, Is it something here. like that? Yeah. There so, you go. You can already see it generated the specials and didn't generate the toppings. Um, and back over to the Swagger UI, refresh. There's the specials, and it didn't generate the topping. So if you have an identity database that you laid on top of that same database, some mm -hmm. other tables, your pizza specials, your pizza toppings, whatever, and they're in the same database as your users, well, you don't want to generate all the ASP.NET user identity information. You can say include just toppings and specials, or you can say exclude and specify all those other tables to exclude. Kind of okay. curious though, Jeff. Are we able to control this on a column level, like you on know, data annotations? No, I don't have that. It, it, right now, we're we're just outputting exactly the information mm -hmm. that that's keyed in there, right? So uh, let me try this out. We'll add a pizza special here, and we'll call it the uh, Galloway Five Thousand. And there we go. So, right. Yep, there it is, the Galloway 5000. I'm going to go nice. and make sure. So if you wanted to include and exclude various columns, that's definitely a feature that could be done. Just a question of priority. Kind of complicated at that point, right? That's yeah, uh, hiding, showing and hiding various columns, right? And I'm, I, I'm guessing, Chris, you're particularly thinking of things like password hash. Yeah, columns. yeah, exactly. Like, yeah. exactly that. Um, that's not a bad idea to add something like that uh, probably a little bit further down the priority chain but yeah. definitely an issue that somebody could open and, and want to take a look at an interesting thing jason's saying here is that if if most of the verbs are handled but you want to exclude a specific one so so this would this work to basically redefine can i call map post <coughs> twice so basically i say instant apis map all the stuff it's also going to say map post and then i have another map post afterwards where i well so where i had include table yeah right um and i had what was it uh api see it's not going to give me that i tell you methods to generate this is actually a flags oh so you can do multiple so you can do multiple and and um logically or them together so right. I am curious, though, if you can just say, like, if you don't put that, mm -hmm. if you uncomment the lines below, mm -hmm. will, does that blow up? Can I say map post twice with the same thing? Let's give it a shot. It's like an override, you mean, or? Exactly. Because um... that's, I mean, and I get that it's not completely the most efficient code because it's calling map post twice on the same thing but whatever <laughs> yeah. right we're just going to do a thing who cares what it is and let's go here right I, I don't care just do the thing so this actually comes to the question of what happens if you run the same method there uh type or namespace um 
This should be uh, my pizza APIs. Yeah, just topping. Do that again. Um, what do we mean? What? What do we got here? No over overload for method map post takes one argument. Uh, it's taking. Oh, it probably want the pattern too, right? The right pattern. Yes. Yeah. Um, which is uh, uh, slash API slash toppings. Is that what it is, or is it just topping? I can't remember. Um, API. I'm guessing it's plural. Try that again. Yeah, this is Chris is saying it's kind of complaining that we have duplicate routes. I would. That's what I would assume I, as well. Uh, maybe not. Let's see. We're Back just, over to. We're doing it live. Do it live. There you go. Yeah. There you go. 500 on the swagger json so it didn't didn't it's like that. it there right there conflicting yeah. method path combination yeah that makes sense but so i could then at that point i could give it a different name or something right um, or um, or i could do like you're doing and we're saying before and use the flags exactly right stuff on my pizza yeah come here I thought I told you to cancel. Do so again. what I think is interesting here too, going back to like what I was saying way at the beginning, we're doing two things here. We're showing, here's a project that you built and we're saying, we're showing how to build on top of this minimal API, you know, API surface. Um, yep. So um, easy to add on to build things with. I didn't feel like we needed versions on this, Chris. It feels like adding versions is is that is one of those steps that's just you're beyond just prototyping at this point. Mm -hmm. you, you're not just right. You're adding new new capabilities to this. A version number in the middle of this just feels weird. Yeah, for sure. What I'm thinking would make sense though is you know various configurations like you did with the JSON thing, right? You said yeah. like, hey, do you want to generate the get but not the post, for example? Yeah. The one um, other thing with the versioning that might be nice is that grow up story. So I, I prototype it out using instant APIs and that's V1. And then I write my finely crafted API that I'm shipping to production and that's V2. Um, so if you wanted to, you're going to give me, no, uh, include, uh, what was it? Include table. Come on now. <laughs> Come on now. No. Uh, nope, not going to give it to me. Um, let's do, yeah, toppings. Right. And uh, API methods to generate all. I could make this API the uh, base right. be V1 toppings. Yeah. Right. Could do that. So then you're clearly like not actually going to ship the mock to production or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Now it's V1 or right. Put whatever in there, a mock or test as your API that you're working with. Yeah. Um, so, so that it's clear that it's included in there. It might be nice to put a universal base URL mm -hmm. uh, at the top of the configuration, but um, we're, we're looking for feedback from folks. Where, where does this go? How does this move your spirit? Is this something that you're interested in? Yeah. Um, as a prototype, as a way, gosh, uh, as a way to build workshops, it, uh, uh, training materials for folks that aren't building the APIs, but they're out building web interfaces. This feels like an easy way for folks to get started and get something productive behind them. So. Yeah. Yep. Here I'm doing a. I was doing a. Hmm, hmm. What are your thoughts, folks? What do you think? Um, that's in the chat. Give us, you know, your thoughts, and then also, um, uh, can you like we're we're kind of good spot to wrap up pretty soon. Do you want to take us over to the repo and just kind of um, remind people how they can get involved? Absolutely. GitHub.com, C Sharp Fritz, Instant APIs. Um, 
and there is a little bit of documentation down here to get you started. We're going to build out a full documentation website here that has samples, different ways that you can use and target configuration, how you want to work with things. I really like that idea of reverse engineering a database and in, in three lines of code, having a complete um, RESTful API available for you. But um, there are a number of issues out here. We'd love to hear from you what you think. Um, it, it'd be great to integrate with AutoMapper. Sure. Have some sort of model object that I'm integrating with. Uh, mapping data to a view model. These feel like they're kind of the same thing. We can pull that together. There's been a request for business logic. Open API configuration of individual APIs. We got to get that Fritz guy to get that name out of the project. <laughs> um, doc site is just about ready to go here. Like I said, we're going to add some features out there. Authorization. Christoph is working on, you can see, he's working on that. But what do you think of a GRPC or GraphQL? Or adding, adding filtering capabilities to some of those get methods. You know, if you want to add write some business logic for the get and have configuration copy that, that in, what does that mean? Um, model binding capabilities and paging on the get methods, I think, when we get larger data sets. Mm -hmm. Be nice to have that. But yeah. I think this can be answered by the GraphQL support. Hey, if you need paging, you need to be working with a larger data set, go use GraphQL. But it's, yeah, yeah. yeah it, it's it, Matt in on YouTube um, asking, isn't this like EF code first migrations? <clears throat> this is like, yes, uh, not code first. This is like EF um, database first because we're starting with a database and generating the APIs for it. I, th um, I think the difference here is like migrations is used to move between versions of a database, right? So yes. er, er, migrating your database to keep in sync with your model classes. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. so that solves that one specific problem. What you're showing more is creating REST API endpoints on top of an existing, you know, so the two kind yeah. of work together. Yep. So, yeah. um, and Regathian... Um, does this need anything special for authorization? We need to be able to pass the configuration, right? What kind of, who do you want to authorize? What does that authorize role or policy collection that we need to decorate the generated API with? What does that look like? How do we pass that configuration through? And the actual um, way that your application connects to identity server or Azure Active Directory, those types of things, that's up to you. You go figure that out. We're just applying that authorization to the minimal APIs that are being generated. You know, I am looking at the authorization docs for minimal APIs, and you can say like app.mapget, and one of the um, methods on that is dot require authorization. Mm -hmm. And so that is possibly something, isn't it? You could say, you could add to the instant APIs where it's a, a you know, an override where it just says like, requires auth or whatever, or, you know, mm -hmm. like authorize. Mm -hmm. Go on. Come on, John. I'm, I'm hearing it. We, well, yeah, yeah. So know. just like as an, as an additional configuration override, you could say blah, 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 dot authorize. So this, require authorization. this project working API is kind of where we have a, a an integration test that actually has it working so that as you're building in, in, um, and, and working on adding features, here's the simple scenario, right? Because yeah. it's a little bit further down the road than just an, a unit test. You need to actually run and, and, and build an, uh, an ASP.NET application so you can see if it generated the APIs properly. But there's your config includes, include table statement to, mm -hmm. John, I'm hearing you describe a very cool dot require roles or require policy yeah. Um, fluent extension method on this include table argument right here. Yeah. Uh, and then no. it would be table level. And you mm -hmm. have that on. Mm -hmm. uh, All right. Feature uh, creep. All no, right. Not feature creep. I think <laughs> you've designed the feature. <laughs> yep. There you go. So there you go. Well, this this is really cool. I love what you've built. Uh, it's, you know, it's cool. There's a there's been over 200 people watching this whole time. They're definitely interested. I've seen a lot of um, positive 
you know, response. I'm also really interested to see what you're building on top of minimal APIs. And yeah. I think this is great to see that minimal API does allow you to write like really lightweight API applications, but you can build quite a bit on top of it. You build a lot of logic and stuff here, right? Oh my gosh. And once you have that API, let's not forget, just add a Docker file in here and now it's sitting inside of a Docker container. You've written five, six lines of code, Docker file, boom, microservice. You're done. Yeah. That's something too that, you know, from seeing the docs and seeing how the team has kind of scoped this, it's really, it's focused like uh, minimal APIs, really sweet spot is not building a big complicated application. It's more a lightweight API that you dockerize and you, your microservices, you have a lot of kind of or multiple small microservices, right? Mm -hmm. And so this is a few lines of code, it's tight, it's lightweight. And then uh, the other thing is learning, getting started prototyping. It's a great way, like what you're showing here, few lines of code. I've, I'm not spending the entire day building Hello World, you know? <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah, right? So. Very cool. All right. Well, I think that's a pretty good place to wrap up. Thank you. Um, this this has been really cool. And then for, for people watching, head on over to the repo and and um, and get started. So. If you're if you're watching the recording, check out. There's a link down below in the YouTube description. Make sure you yeah. click through down there. Yeah, exactly. Cool. Awesome. All right. Well, I will play the music and uh, and uh, we'll we'll say goodbye. So thanks a bunch, folks. Yeah. Thanks, thanks for watching.